Hi, if you don't know me, my name's Andy. I'm a filmmaker. I make my living running the YouTube channel that you are uh, currently watching, which is called Atun Shea Films. I mostly do historical educational stuff with a bit of cinematic flair. Some lanyap, as they say in New Orleans. A little something extra. I love making dorky videos and little documentaries for my viewers, but my true passion is making narrative films. Since making this my full-time job in 2020, I've had a good number of opportunities to do just that, and my audience, to their credit, has been happy to go along for the ride. Within the past year, I've released two narrative film projects. First, a horror feature called The Sudbury Devil, a bodily fluid-soaked artsy romp through 17th century New England. I know not where to begin. The second film was the hour-long final episode of Checkmate Lincolnites, my most popular web series, which interweaves educational and theatrical elements. Infantry! Pour it into him, boy! <laughs> the finale was a blowout, slam-bang finish of fan service, broad police squad-style humor, and lightsabers for some reason. <laughs> the films were both written and directed by me, were produced on a shoestring budget, and feature a lot of the same talent both on and off camera. But apart from that, they couldn't be more radically different in terms of form, content, production, and release. I'd like to compare and contrast these two projects as essentially two different business models for the quote-unquote YouTuber movie. In this time of profound upheaval in the entertainment industry and the ascendance of new media in the hearts and minds of consumers, I hope this information can prove useful to other filmmakers who are maybe considering embarking on a non-traditional career path. I released my first feature film, The Sudbury Devil, on September 9th, 2023, in a big premiere at the Satanic Temple in Salem, Massachusetts. My producer and I also cold-called a bunch of funky art house venues all over the world. Not just theaters, but like music clubs, art galleries, vegan restaurants, pretty much anywhere with a pride flag on the door and graffiti in the bathrooms. And said, look, I'm a moderately famous YouTuber and I made a movie. Want to screen it? We can split the profits. This ersatz little roadshow was a smashing success, as far as I'm concerned. The movie played on 25 screens in three countries. We packed theaters, we built hype, we got good reviews, and earned $12,955 for our efforts. A piddling amount in the grand scheme of the movie business, to be sure, but compare that to the film's budget of $25,000. We'd already made more than half our money back, and we knew that it would be nothing compared to what we would make in streaming. Oh, and Sudbury was also a co-op production, so the core cast and crew earned sizable percentages of the net gross. Believe it or not, I didn't get into independent filmmaking for the money. But in this case, I did have a vested interest to make as large a profit as possible so I could do right by my people. Pretty much as soon as I announced that I had completed production on a feature film, a bunch of D-level distribution companies descended into my inbox like a plague of locusts, offering to put the movie on streaming services. I was initially very excited by this and felt like the bell of the ball. But when we got down to brass tacks, all of these companies wanted either me to pay an exorbitant upfront fee, which, uh, no, I have the film and the audience, those motherfuckers should have been offering to pay me, or truly outrageous licensing terms, like they'd have full rights to the movie for 15 years, which was also a big no. Against the advice of my lawyer, I told all these people to stick it where the sun don't shine, and decided to do the streaming release exactly like we had done the theatrical one completely independently. I signed up for Vimeo's VHX service, which lets you host video files to buy or rent. I hooked it up to my website and officially released the movie for streaming on December 21st of last year. I estimated that the numbers Sudbury would pull might be about on par with like a badly performing YouTube video. Obviously the paywall would turn a lot of people away, but the enthusiasm among my core audience was intense to say the least. Around the time of the premiere, I was getting dozens of emails and hundreds of comments every day asking when it would be available digitally. Going into the release, I was confident that we would net upwards of a quarter million dollars. Sadly, that didn't happen. A little over six months after release, streaming through my website has netted us 
$59,251. With the theatrical take, that means the Sudbury Devil made three times its budget from independent distributing means alone. On one hand, this is a staggering success for any movie at this price point. On the other, we clearly didn't mobilize the kinds of numbers we were highly confident that we could. So what went right, and what went wrong? Ultimately, I'm very glad that we did the self-distribution thing. After our streaming release, we had the money in our bank accounts mere days later. That's amazing. Shortly after the release, I was telling the cast and crew in our little group chat that I was a bit disappointed by our financial performance, and the DP and two of the lead actors were like, look man, this is the most I've ever been paid for a film. And you know what? That's huge. Even though going with a more traditional distributor would have probably exposed us to a much, much larger audience, I'm highly doubtful that we would have been individually enriched nearly as much as we were. I recently spoke with a director who had released his film through one of these sketchy indie distribution companies, and his movie was a lot bigger than mine. It had name actors and got reviewed on Half in the Bag and shit. Well, it's been years, and he hasn't seen a single red cent of that money. Plus, he says those companies are a fucking nightmare to work with, so I feel like we really dodged a bullet. However, what we gained from control over our work and our money, we lost in terms of audience accessibility. When you release a movie on a streaming service that's baked into your smart TV, you need only hold the remote up to your mouth and say, bloop, the Sudbury Devil, and it'll pop up. Self-releasing on my website meant that viewers had to hop onto their computer, create an account, get their credit card, Oh shit, where did I leave that again? Ah, oh, it's in the other room. Get up from the couch, get their wallet or their purse, you know, sit down back in front of the computer, punch in the numbers, log in. Okay, so here it is on my computer. How do I get that on the TV? Ah, oh, I gotta go fish around the little fucking bin in my closet for an HDMI cord. Uh, I gotta figure out the Chromecast, whatever. The result is that the process you have to go through to watch the film is needlessly Baroque at best and downright frustrating at worst. Whereas if you buy a film through Jeff Bezos, well, he's already got your credit card on file. It's a breeze. Another problem we had, or more honestly, something that I kind of dropped the ball on, was a lack of forethought into our release timeline. We premiered this film in early September, as I said, and did our roadshow over the course of the next six weeks. After that, there was a bit of a lull as we wasted time negotiating with the distribution companies, which, of course, fell through. We made the relatively last-minute decision to self-distribute that November, and set a December release date. By then, some of the hype for the film had waned. The internet has a short memory. Late December is also a really weird time to release a horror film, but frankly, I was working on this project for four fucking years, and I was just ready to be done with it. If I could do it over again, I wouldn't have premiered the movie without knowing exactly how I was going to distribute it. I also would have insisted that theaters screen it before the end of October, and then gone with a Halloween streaming release date. Our third mistake is a classic one. Overconfidence. I think that since the theatrical run was such an unexpected success, we hubristically just assumed that the streaming one would be too. But I think I specifically was blind to the fact that the greater portion of my audience's tastes are not exactly my tastes. I cover all sorts of topics and genres in my YouTube channel, and it has given me a quite eclectic viewership. I like to say Atun Shea fans are an odd collection of 20-something white male military history dorks, genealogy grandmas of old New England stock, and heavily armed transgender anarchists. Sudbury only really appeals to the latter two, but the first group is by far the most numerous, and I think a lot of them were frankly a little scandalized by Goodnow and the Cumrock. Yes, you heard me right. The grandmas were extremely game for Sudbury. Grandma can handle herself around a Cumrock. It's why she's grandma. We had hoped that word of mouth would widen our audience pool from the core of Atun Shea fans out to a broader community of horror movie nerds, hipsters, goths, and weirdos. We actually saw this during our theatrical run quite a bit. Based on Q&As we were present for and talking to the venue owners, it was clear that about a third to a half of the audience who saw the movie in theaters had no idea who I was and were just checking it out because it looked like a cool horror flick at their local art house. When it became apparent that that wasn't happening with streaming at nearly the rate we expected, I decided to be a bit more proactive with the marketing. The first thing we did was fully flex the most powerful marketing tool we had, which was my social media following. 
In February of 2024, I made a promotional video with the Checkmate Lincolnites characters, which is, again, my most popular web series, and saw a very respectable bump in sales comparable to our opening week. But again, this was still within the Atunche bubble. To reach audiences outside of it, we felt we needed to do a deal with the devil and put the movie on traditional streaming services. The first thing I did was sign up for Amazon Slate, which is a vanity publishing tool offered by Prime Video. Once the movie was approved and went up for sale and rent on Amazon, I invested about $400 into YouTube and Google ads for the months of April and May. This netted us $1,952 in profits. Not amazing, but not too shabby either. I specifically didn't promote the Prime Video release to Atun Shea fans because I wanted them to continue to buy the movie through the website, rather than cut Jeff in on the action. This also helped create a bit of a barometer of who was buying the movie because they were a fan of Atun Shea and who was buying it because they found it organically. By then, website sales had slowed, so it was actually pretty evenly matched. Then I signed up for FilmHub, a more generalized distribution website which will pitch your movie to some of the less prestigious streaming services, your Tubies, your Voodoos, etc., in exchange for 20% of your revenue. Just a couple weeks ago, Tubi published the movie on their platform, and I finally announced that we were on the more traditional streamers. The same day, I also slashed the price of the movie on my website by half and said on social media, you know, the movie's free on Tubi, but if you want to go the extra mile and support the filmmakers, buy it from us directly. There's also really cool special features. Since getting on Tubi, we've had a huge explosion in viewership. Unfortunately, FilmHub doesn't tell you your exact views, but based on increased activity on sites like Letterboxd and IMDb, as well as the word of mouth we're seeing on social media, I wouldn't be surprised if the free viewership was just as large, if not larger, than the website views we took half a year to rack up. It's probably too early to tell, but it also seems like we are finally breaking into the broader horror community, based on comments we're seeing like, what is this low-budget bullshit? And I guess this freaky sex movie was made by a YouTuber. That's fucking weird. In total, as of July 2024, the movie has made $74,266 on, again, an approximately 25 grand budget. I suspect ad revenue from Tubi will bump that, that up quite a bit, but uh, I haven't seen any of that money yet. Unlike the Sudbury Devil, the finale episode of Checkmate Lincolnites was laboratory made to appeal to Atun Shea fans, and only Atun Shea fans. As a broad, Hollywood-style action-adventure spoof, it is also quite a bit more accessible to general audiences. Though production of the finale was certainly not nearly on the same scale as Sudbury, which was a full feature that took four years to make from script to screen, it was nonetheless insanely expensive and involved for what is at the end of the day, a YouTube skit. I finished the script in January 2024 and filmed it on weekends over the course of the next four months, editing as we went. In May, I handed it off to the composer and the visual effects artist who completed post in time for a YouTube release on June 7th. The budget was approximately $12,000. Unlike Sudbury, we did not do the co-op thing and instead paid everybody up front. Most of the budget was spent on wages, but what really put a hole in our pocket was the elaborate climactic battle scene. We moved the whole company up to rural Mississippi for a three-night shoot, uh, where of course we had to feed and house everybody as well as pay for all their travel costs. As costs racked up during production, it became clear that this finale was probably going to lose money. This was a little alarming. Checkmate Lincolnites has traditionally been this channel's piggy bank. Its most popular episode, in fact, generated nearly $8,000 in ad revenue in its first month. As long as I dropped a Checkmate Lincolnites episode every once in a while, I could easily afford to take time to work on my own passions, my esoteric, artsy bullshit, which appeals more to the core fans. A one-for-them, one-for-me type of scenario. Obviously, this was the last episode, so I felt some pressure to at the very least break even. I was complaining about this to a YouTuber friend, and he suggested that I release it basically the same way I did Sudbury through my website to buy or rent. While I have no doubt this would have been insanely financially profitable, it just didn't feel right. Checkmate is a YouTube web series. It belongs on YouTube. At the same time, though, I could definitely see the wisdom in what he was saying. So I took that idea and I skewed it a bit. I do early access for all my videos on Patreon, but for the finale, I made it available there way ahead of time, more than a week ahead of its release, and widely advertised on social media that folks could watch the episode early for a cool 10 bucks. 
The resulting influx of money to the Patreon earned $1,964 that week, and many of the folks who joined for Checkmate have continued to stick around. The video's release was a hit, at least in terms of views and audience reception. It was the highest performing video in the history of my channel during its first day. The finale has made, by YouTube Studios' estimation, $3,184 in ad revenue. Since my Patreon supporters pay me to run the channel, and making this finale was part of my full-time job and not a side project like Sudbury, I'll also add my full Patreon earnings for June into the calculus. Things get a little murkier when you consider ad revenue made from other videos that people watched because of the algorithmic bump that the finale gave the channel, but let's not worry about that too much. In total, the cornerstone of Johnny Reb directly made $9,630 on about a 12 grand budget. Obviously, that's not great. But I have another scheme to make up for that lost money. As of today, props from Checkmate Lincolnites will go on sale on my Etsy store for outrageous prices, including the American and Confederate flags that have hung in the background of every video, and the Civil War chess set that Bill Yank gave to Johnny Reb for Christmas. Confederate skeletons are also available in various states of dismemberment. Again, independent filmmakers generally aren't in it for the money. You can't really put a price point on the emotional and spiritual value of art, but we can't be truly independent artists by definition unless we are at least making enough to live on and fund our projects. While Sudbury was definitely a financial success, if I could do it over again, I would do a hybrid plan for distribution, releasing the movie in theaters, on my website, and on traditional streaming services within a much tighter window of time, like say, two months rather than ten. Then I could spend that two months putting a hefty amount of time and money into a concentrated marketing campaign, using multiple tools and strategies to net as many eyeballs as possible from as far afield as possible. My experience has shown me that directly uploading movies to YouTube is not a viable or sustainable business model, unless you're netting millions or tens of millions of views. You need some kind of paywall. Unless, of course, the movie cost literally nothing, which I know some YouTube filmmakers have done, like Joel Haver. I'm very much making this YouTube filmmaking thing up as I go along, so I'm not sure how much my advice is actually worth, but if any young or aspiring filmmakers are watching this and considering taking a non-traditional career path like I did, I'd just like to say that it really depends on what you want to do. If your passion is to make films the way you want to make them, and you want your stuff to get seen by a passionate, though maybe not enormous, fan base, then honestly, I couldn't recommend the content creator route more. My channel gave our film a huge leg up in pretty much every sense, at every stage of production. When I made shorts and submitted them to festivals, virtually no one saw those movies. But now, thanks to my channel, millions of people watch my stuff, and my feature has found a cult following that enjoys and appreciates it. I have friends I went to film school with who are out in LA with great jobs and traditional careers, but it always seems like they're working on somebody else's projects, and the shows and movies they do work on seem at least as ephemeral and disposable in this age of streaming as my YouTube videos do. Heck, I think at least two of my web series are more indelible within their niche than most Netflix originals are with the general public. My reach is much smaller than Hollywood's, and my budgets are way lower. But my audience seems just as enthusiastic about the stuff that I make as Marvel fans are about the latest Disney Plus show or whatever. But at the same time, there will always be a place in cinema for a huge, expensive, big screen spectacle. And that's something that as independent filmmakers will never be able to do without studio backing. If you love special effects and technological innovation, the big and the groundbreaking, if you love James Cameron and John Ford and David Lean, then you should definitely go the traditional route. The walls between old media and new media are rapidly crumbling, but something like Denis Villeneuve's Dune isn't going to come out on YouTube anytime soon. But obviously, just keep in mind that in Hollywood, the chances of you working on the kind of shit you want to make are slim to none. You'll probably spend a career working to bring other people's ideas to life. And you know, maybe I'm just an asshole, but I'm not built like that. If you want to check out The Sudbury Devil or The Cornerstone of Johnny Reb, the links are below. Thanks for watching.